Encyclopedia Section 108. In so far as in measure, quality and quantity are only in immediate unity. To that extent, their difference presents itself in a matter equally immediate. Two cases are then possible. Either the specific quantum or measure is a bare quantum, and the definite being there and then is capable of an increase or a diminution. Without measure, which to that extent is a rule, being thereby set completely aside, or the alteration of the quantum is also an alteration of the quality. The identity between quantity and quality, which is found in measure, is at least, pardon, the identity between quantity and quality, which is found in measure, is at first only implicit, and not yet explicitly realized. In other words, these two categories, which unite in measure, each claim an independent authority. On the one hand, the quantitative features of existence may be altered without affecting its quality. On the other hand, this increase in diminution, immaterial though it be, has its limit by exceeding which the quality suffers change. Thus, the temperature of water is, in the first place, a point of no consequence in respect of its liquidity. Still, with the increase or diminution of the temperature of the liquid water, there comes a point where the state of cohesion suffers a qualitative change, and the water is converted into steam or ice. A quantitative change takes place, apparently without any further significance, but there is something lurking behind it. And a seemingly innocent change of quantity acts as a kind of snare to catch hold of the quality. The antimony of measure, which this implies, was exemplified under more than one garb among the Greeks. It was asked, for example, whether a single grain makes a heap of wheat, or whether it makes a bald tail to tear out a single hair from the horse's tail. At first, no doubt, looking at the nature of quantity as an indifferent and external character of being, we are disposed to answer these questions in the negative. And yet, as we must admit, this indifferent increase and in diminution has its limit. A point is finally reached where a single additional grain makes a heap of wheat and the ball tail is produced if we continue plucking out single hairs. So, you're standing on your soap box and you say, this is a horse's tail. This is a heap of wheat. And someone asks you, without waiting for you to finish your tail, or your, your, your example, I should say, to use a different word, if I pluck out one hair from a horse's tail, is the horse bald? where its tail should be. If I drop a single grain of wheat, have I created a heap? Well, if so, then the answer would be, of course not. That's silly. Why would you bring up such an example? Here's your hair. Look at that one grain upon the ground. By removing a hair from the horse's tail, it is not bald. 
by placing a single grain of wheat upon the ground, there is no heat. Well, sir, you, you've made a leap there. I'm assuming we're going to continually pull hairs from the horse. And is there a point that when pulling a hair from the horse, the last hair of its tail, uh, that it is bald? And is there a point where something that is not a heap yet of wheat, adding one grain is now a heap? And to, so those are large examples, meta examples, you would say. Or, uh, consider uh, the quantum example, for instance, of I have in front of me a case in which eggs are placed. There are 11 eggs in 12 places. Do I have a dozen eggs placed in the carton? No. So I would ask, if I place this one egg in that carton, do I have a dozen eggs now? Do I have a dozen? Well, the answer is yes. If you place one egg in a carton where there are already 11 eggs, you have a dozen. There is a limit that you haven't reached that you will reach. Then I might ask, Uh, that cake you have is sliced into 17 pieces, correct? Yes. Well, those 17 pieces have already been distributed all but one. Oh, do you still have a cake? Yes, that one piece left still constitutes a cake. And if I were to take that one piece, would you then not have a cake? Well, yes, if you took that one piece, I wouldn't have a cake. Is it okay if I take that one piece? Because I don't know if not having cake will ruin our relationship with each other. Well, thank you for asking. It won't ruin our relationship because you asked. But yeah, if you just took it, I would be very unhappy. Uh, so this is two adults speaking. This is you and I speaking. Uh, what if you're teaching your child something? Uh, bring me a dozen eggs. This recipe calls for a dozen eggs. Someone's done the chemistry. It takes 12 eggs to make this cake. They bring the carton and there are only 11. Or they say, we don't have a dozen eggs. So I didn't bring any. How many did they have? They only had 11. And by the time I go back, they may not have those. So communication, it becomes very essential to communicate, to listen to an entire question and to think it out. Now that you've heard this example, uh, you'll be able to have a better conversation when someone asks you uh, certain types of questions uh, that you would otherwise find rude are diminishing to your character uh, in reality they are asking they've anticipated your speech and they're getting to the end of it and say well will it always be a horse's tail when is it a heap of grain because i only stack heaps of grain or you, you, my job is to make a heap or my job is to uh, make sure the horse has a tail when we sell it. People don't like to buy bald horses. So how many strands of hair equate to a tail and at one point do we not have a tail? And the place that you can find this information, the best place on earth right now is in the European Union uh, and their trade bills. Uh, what is what what is a dozen eggs? Uh, and are they a dozen large age eggs, medium eggs, small eggs? Uh, what is privacy? What is the measure? The European Union has done an excellent job 
excellent job, and some would say then an awful job, <laughs> but an excellent job of quantifying uh, qualities. Uh, they, they measure better than anyone else on earth if you're looking for exact measures. And they do that because they completely expect that their measure system will conquer the earth and the solar system as we expand into it. Uh, so, so mode it be. All right, so to continue, uh, these examples find a parallel in the story of the peasant who, as his ass trudged cheerfully along, went on adding ounce after ounce to its load, till at length it sunk under the unendurable burden. It would be a mistake to treat these examples as pedantic futility. They really turn on thoughts, an acquaintance with which is of great importance in practical life, especially in ethics. Thus, in the matter of expenditure, there is a certain latitude within which a more or less does not matter. But when the measure imposed by the individual circumstances of the special case is exceeded on the one side or the other, the qualitative nature of measure, as in the above examples of the different temperature of water, makes itself felt, and a course which a moment before has held good economy turns into avarice or prodigality. Son. The same principle may be applied in politics, when the constitution of a state has to be looked at as independent of, no less than as dependent on, the extent of its territory, the number of its inhabitants, and other quantitative points of the same kind. If we look, ergo, at a state with a territory of 10,000 square miles and a population of 4 million, we should without hesitation admit that a few square miles of land or a few thousand inhabitants more or less could exercise no essential influence on the character of its constitution. But on the other hand, we must not forget that by the continual increase or diminishing of a state, we finally get to a point where, apart from all other circumstances, this quantitative alteration alone necessarily draws with it an alteration in the quality of the Constitution. The Constitution of a little Swiss canton does not suit a great kingdom, and similarly, the constitution of the Roman Republic was unsuitable when transferred to the small imperial towns of Germany. Encyclopedia section 109. In this second case, when a measure through its quantitative nature has gone in excess of its qualitative character, we meet what is at first an absence of measure, the measureless. But seeing that the second quantitative ratio, which in comparison with the first is measureless, is nonetheless qualitative, the measureless is also a measure. These two transitions from quality to quantum and from the latter back again to quality may be represented under the image of an infinite progression as the self-abrogation and restoration of measure in the measureless. Quantity, as we have seen, is not only capable of alteration, in essence an increase or diminution, it is naturally and necessarily a tendency to exceed itself. They embraced, and David exceeded himself. This tendency is maintained even in measure, but if the quantity pre present in measure exceeds a certain limit, the quality corresponding to it is also put in abeyance. This, however, is not a negation of quality altogether, 
but only of this definite quality, the place of which is at once occupied by another, this process of measure, which appears alternatively as a mere change in quantity, and then as a sudden revulsion of quantity, itself quality may be envisaged under the figure of a nodal knotted line. Such lines we find in nature under a variety of forms. We have already referred to the qualitatively different states of aggregation water exhibits under increase of diminution or of temperature. The same phenomenon is present by the different degrees of the oxidation of metals. Even the difference of musical notes may be regarded as an example of what takes place in the process of measure. The revulsion from what is at first merely quantitative into qualitative alteration. Again, this book is written uh, in the early 1800s and refers to uh, things that were known beforehand. But one thing he mentions here are atoms. Uh, atoms in combination, when they are you atoms which are formed of uh, four base pairs, uh, the four base pairs that make up uh, DNA, uh, when, when they combine together, atoms of uh, deoxyribonucleic acid uh, are called chromosomes. Uh, most people gain 23 chromosomes from their male contributor, uh, often called father, and 23 from their female contributor, often called mother. Uh, and the specific chromosomes that you gather come from uh, the entirety of history of uh, life on earth uh, and more specifically from your entire family uh, are put together if for some reason you have one more chromosome or one less chromosome uh, than the 46 that are named you will have a qualitatively different uh, experience and possibly presentation uh, than someone else. Uh, so while we may say uh, there are 46 chromosomes, to have 45 or 47 will create a qualitative difference uh, in an individual, and maybe even whether or not we consider that individual of the same species as uh, the others who have a different uh, qu qualitative, uh, who have a different number. But Within the 46 normal amount, we may find uh, different qualities as well uh, by having more base pair. Uh, maybe you have one type of base pair or one type of, of the four uh, in greater quantity than others. Within the 46, uh, this could also create a difference as well. So officially... Uh, officially, Hegel uh, did not understand or would not have known DNA, but uh, there is a process that if you, I'm, I'm watching uh, at the moment, The X-Files Season 3, uh, at the time of this recording in 2022, uh, they are available on the Hulu uh, application, and you can probably go to Apple uh, and or to YouTube and just buy the episode separately, but in Season 3, uh, the agent called Dana, a Danish woman, Scully, is looking to compare uh, DNA uh, from an individual uh, who has shot her uh, immediate supervisor, uh, who was named, uh, uh, well, Skinner uh, is the name that uh, he, he has. Uh, and she notices, uh, or she decides to compare it with a DNA uh, sequence a run for a person who has uh, shot uh, her sister. And she is able to cross them over each other and see that they are the same uh, unique pattern uh, is presented. Well, so let's be begin at a simple example and move up on how this could have always been known throughout human history, at least back to the time of the Egyptians. And I specifically say the Egyptians with knowledge, not just throwing them out there as a group of people, but knowing 
that Egypt uh, was called Kemet or Kemia, and Kemia is the base word of chemistry. The Egyptians were known to be excellent chemists, uh, and even calling their nation Kemia or Kemet as a result of it. Uh, if I have a liquid in front of me that's clear, and I want to know if the liquid contains, let's say, uh, copper, uh, because I want to see if I can extract it, I can add something into the liquid that will then oxidize it and changes its color, and I can say, yes, this liquid contains copper. Uh, there are other uh, there are other liquids that you can pour on a certain type of paper, and paper is something that developed in China and Egypt at the same time. Uh, Chinese used rice. The Egyptians used either a banana leaf or something called papyrus, where we get the word, uh, which is a type of uh, uh, let's say palm uh, that grows near the Nile River. Uh, it flattened out and uh, made whole, uh, dried, uh, you can write on it or you could stain it. Um, and certain, uh, let's say, orange juice, which has a certain acidity to it, you can pour orange juice on a piece of paper uh, and determine uh, through certain ways that it dries and the type of patterns it creates and uh, its, its coloring, uh, later on that there is orange juice on it without necessarily measuring it a, a different way by pouring something on it to see if there's orange juice uh, to, to make a reaction that only can happen. Uh, you mix one thing with another and it only shows up a certain way. There was a way to take saliva, spit people will say, uh, from the gums um, and place it uh, on a piece of paper um, and then apply a solution to it and possibly pressure and it would show you uh, a certain pattern. That pattern uh, would tell you uh, the genetic makeup of a person. So it may not tell you uh, this individual has uh, a chromosome uh, which codes for blue eyes. But it would show you that this pattern only belongs to this group of people as they've been constituted. So if, uh, for instance, uh, your wife became pregnant and you weren't sure if the child is your own, uh, once the child was born, uh, you would take uh, a sample from its gums and you would uh, apply this measure to it. And if in general, uh, it applied to your family group, your tribal group, you would assume that child was your own. But if uh, there was a radically different uh, <clears throat> a set of uh, patterns uh, there, then you would say, well, this child cannot be from my tribe or my culture, uh, so it is not my own. Again, controlling for the fact that that individual uh, hopefully has provided his uh, cheek residue and to compare it with the, the reference sample to see that maybe he didn't come from a different tribe. So this is how law would be engaged. So we've been able to detect patterns of chromosomes, of DNA, uh, for thousands of years and make general applications that this plant is genetically similar to this one uh, in a general sense. And it is only within the last, um, uh, let's say, 20 years that we've believe uh, that we've cataloged every single part of DNA and that we can say with exact measure this uh, allele or chromosome applies to this particular function. Uh, we may find out more later but not yet but this science, the science of taking a stain uh, of saliva and determining whether or not two people are related is extremely old and has been around for a very long time uh, to determine family groups and responsibilities, even kingship. So if uh, a king uh, dies and you have a succession where either his son or his daughter uh, is going to take power, uh, it may be that until they take power, you, as a court, 
take their samples uh, in the king dead or alive, you can still take his DNA and compare it to the king. Is this his son? Is this his daughter? Is, are these people part of our tribe? And so in determining that, say they both are his son and daughter, then likely you're going to take uh, the son uh, as the next king. If for some reason that son is all not to be the son of the king, but the daughter is, the, uh, then she's taken as the queen. If both of them are found to be, let's say, adopted, uh, or let's say his wife uh, took different spouses without him knowing, uh, or he couldn't produce and he's been hiding uh, the fact that these two individuals are a son and daughter uh, for or some other reason, uh, then you would look to his brother or sister uh, to rule. Because going back to the Iqing, or the Iqing, it is very likely that the people in this household and for generations have a certain skill to rule the people, either psychologically, emotionally, or otherwise, and you want to keep going with this family. You, you set them up as your king, your ruler, your pharaoh, your other individual, but you want to make sure it's the same family, because if it isn't, or if that person isn't related, uh, you, don't, you, you're, you don't have the same chromosomal uh, complement as the person who came before, and so you, you don't want to hand it over to them. Also, uh, you may say that, oh, that last, those last three individuals uh, were awful. Uh, what we've done in the past is when we had three in a row that we would just collectively hated, we switched to a different dynasty and we moved over uh, to another one. So in China, uh, until the year 1900 or so, uh, China was ruled by the Qiong or the Qing dynasty. Uh, people who, at least in their later years, uh, appeared to be uh, the way you would consider a, a Russian today. Uh, they would have uh, clearly European and Asiatic features. And this, uh, this dynasty ruled. Uh, it was determined at some point uh, that they were no longer preferred. And so a different dynasty was, uh, well, officially uh, uh, the monarchy was ended. But in reality, uh, a different dynasty took hold. They are the, the Te uh, dynasty, or the Tang dynasty, uh, as you were, uh, who are still there. The, the president of China today, 2023, uh, 2022, uh, uh, President uh, Xi, or, or Qi, or, or Qi, depends on how you say uh, his name with the XI, uh, I believe is Te dynasty, uh, who had their origins on uh, Taiwan, or uh, Taiwan. Uh, and so there, a different dynasty is picked up. In Russia, uh, until officially, until the October Revolution, uh, though, again, there's been word that the dynasty is being restored, but it hasn't, the Romanov dynasty ruled for 300 years, and before that, there was a different one. Uh, and so the Romanov dynasty is being uh, redeemed, uh, and long live it, uh, but it's also possible that uh, in the future, another dynasty will take hold or they'll combine with each other. So we know who they are by their DNA. I know uh, that I have Romanov heritage uh, because in my DNA profile, the name of a Romanov individual, the last, uh, the last czar, is in my profile, uh, Czar Nicholas II. Uh, he is a relative. Um, now, He's placed in such a way where I don't know which chromosome he falls on, so I'm probably not the best candidate to be Tsar of Russia. However, uh, I do know uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, Prince Charles and Prince William are on, we share at least one chromosome overlapping with each other, probably others, but at least one. Uh, and therefore, one, I can prove that they are related to each other, and I am related to them. And this is why the United Kingdom has certain laws, that if you don't descend from a certain individual and within a certain family, and that you were produced in a marriage uh, that was in the church there, the Church of England, and your marriage didn't come from that respect, uh, then you can't be a uh, monarch. You can't become uh, king of, of uh, the United Kingdom, for instance, or Queen of the United Kingdom, because a person like me will say, well, I know I have a chromosomal match 
with these two individuals, why can't I be at least considered for king of the United Kingdom? It's because the law says otherwise. And this is a law that was put in place by royal families, and it is better, uh, I believe it is better to follow it. Uh, but other places uh, may not have that rule. And so if I have a chromosomal overlap uh, with, let's say, a monarchy that has fallen away, um, I may be able then uh, to be asked to rule. And so taking myself out of the equation, uh, this has happened. Uh, there are a number of monarchies that have fallen away and individuals have then uh, been unofficially named to them and maybe they'll be able to hold on to them later on uh, because they have right to do so. One being the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire uh, being held by Prince Carl Philip of Sweden uh, because he has right to do so. Uh, then and he has the ability to affect it. Uh, so, because it isn't established, you could establish it again with him. Uh, okay, so that that's uh, just one way that we've probably known for a very long time uh, DNA and who is related to whom. Even if I can't say this is your father, this is your mother, I can say that you are at least of the same uh, tribal heritage as this person, and therefore it is likely that uh, you two are related. Now I can tell you that this individual is not only your father, and this individual is not only your mother, but your mother and father are cousins. Um, and so we can go in quite a lot of detail uh, to determine, and the, and you have these races or these cultures uh, within your family heritage. Okay, so we're moving on to Encyclopedia Section 110 uh, next. Encyclopedia section 110, what really takes place here is that the immediacy, which still attaches to measure as such, is set aside. In measure at first, quality and quantity itself are immediate, and measure is only their relative identity. But measure shows itself absorbed and superseded in the measureless. Yet the measureless, although it be the negation of measure, is itself a unity of quantity and quality. Thus, in the measureless, the measure is still seen to meet only with itself. The measureless is a conomen, you can say, or a, uh, a token for the word infinity. Uh, infinity is a place on the number line. Uh, it's just represented uh, by something other than a number. As represented by a symbol or a concept or a philosophy, but it is there. Uh, so the measureless uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So infinity exists as a place on the number line. It is just impossible to measure it because as soon as you measure it, it is changed. Uh, and that's the one of the ways we look at infinity. And I learned that from Rene Ganon, uh, the the reign of quantity and the signs of the time is the name of the book. And that here, it does exist on my YouTube channel, uh, R-E-N-E-G-U-E-N-O-N. -E -E and he and I share uh, this mystical tradition of what I would call Ladino uh, mysticism, a, a Jewish sect of North Africa, which is also Islamic Sufism, uh, the uh, Ismaili Shia. Uh, so it is uh, the Jewish tradition that comes from Ishmael instead of Isaac, uh, just to be have a complete factor. And that tradition became Islam. Uh, so it is still practiced today as a form of Judaism uh, with the title Islam. So uh, the final section of chapter seven, uh, encyclopedia section 111, or the final uh, encyclopedia chapter, or the final encyclopedia section 111, Instead of the more abstract factors, being and nothing, some and other and similar things, the infinite, which is, affirm which is affirmation, instead of the more abstract factors, being and nothing, some and other and such, the infinite, which is affirmation as a negation of negation, now finds its factors in quality and quantity. These, in the encyclopedia section, Encyclopedia Paragraph, Section 111, Infra Subdivision Alpha. These, Alpha, have in the first place passed over quality into quantity. To learn more, see Encyclopedia Section 
uh, paragraph 98, and quantity into quality in Encyclopedia section 105, and thus are both shown up as negation. So these alpha have in the first place passed over quality into quantity and quantity into quality, and thus are both shown up as negations. So in for subdivision beta, but in their unity, that is, in measure, they are originally distinct, and the one is only through the instrumentality of the other, and in for subdivision gamma, after the immediacy of this unity has turned out to be self-annulling, the unity is explicitly put as what it implicitly is, simple relation to itself, which contains in it being and all its forms absorbed, being or immediacy, which by the negation of itself is a mediation with itself and a reference to self, which consequently is also a mediation which cancels itself into reference to self, or immediacy is essence. The process of measure, instead of being only the wrong infinite of an endless progression in the shape of an ever-recurrent recoil from quality to quantity and from quantity to quality, is also the true infinity of coincidence with self and another. In measure, quality and quantity originally confront each other like some and other, but quality is implicitly quantity, and conversely, quantity is implicitly quality. In the process of measure, therefore, these two pass into each other. Each of them becomes what it already was implicitly, and thus we get being thrown into abeyance and absorbed with its several characteristics negatived. Such being is essence. Measure is implicitly essence, and its process consists in realizing what it is implicitly, and its process consists in realizing what it is implicitly. Remember the double slit light test. The ordinary consciousness conceives things as being. The studies and the ordinary consciousness conceives things as being and studies them in quality quantity and measure. These immediate characteristics, however, soon show themselves to be not fixed, but transient. And essence is the result of their dialectic. In the sphere of essence, one category does not pass into another, but refers to another merely. In being, the form of reference is purely due to our reflection on what takes place, but it is the special and proper characteristic of essence. In the sphere of being, when somewhat becomes another, the somewhat has vanished. Not so in essence. Here there is no real other, but only diversity, reference of the one to its other. The transition of essence is therefore at the same time no transition, for in the passage of difference into difference, the different does not vanish. The different terms remain in their relation when we speak of being and not. Being is independent, so is not. The case is otherwise with the positive and the negative. No doubt these possess the characteristic of being and not, but the positive by itself has no sense. It is wholly in reference to the negative, and it is the same with the negative. In the sphere of being, the reference of one term to another is only implicit in essence. On the contrary, it is explicit, and this in general is the distinction between the forms of being and essence. In being, everything is immediate. In essence, everything is relative.